Sally said, wouldn't it be great if we had so many celebrations that I didn't have time to preach? And it seems often that when Sally does a children's moment, I don't need to preach anyway because she's already done my sermon. So that'll work out just fine. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit. We feel your presence. We thank you for being here. We thank you for reminding us of all the many things we have to celebrate. For reminding us of those who don't have as much to celebrate and who actually even struggle to have enough food to eat. We thank you that the abundance that you have given to us, Lord, we can share with them. Fill me, Lord, with the word that you would have me to share today and help me to speak it clearly and in a way that we can hear your words, your message for us. Give us, Lord, hearts to receive the message and to answer as you call us. In Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday was World Communion Sunday, and if you were here for worship last week, you may remember that I invited you to write a short prayer for the world and to leave it on the altar rail. And many of you did so. Here they are. After worship, Jay Messenger asked what I was going to do with the prayers. He suggested that I might share them on our church's Facebook page or in an ad in the newspaper. And I thought that both of those were really great ideas. The problem was I had not asked for your permission to publish your prayers, to share them with others. In fact, I had not even asked for your permission to read your prayers myself. And so, I did not feel that I should read your prayers or share them with others. Your prayers for the world are between you and God. And this week, I have lifted these prayers to God and said, Lord, here are our prayers for the world. You know what they are. God knows what you wrote, even though I do not. And as I thought more about our prayers for the world, I was reminded that when God created the world, he gave us, humans, stewardship over the land and the water and the plants and the animals. God created a wonderful, beautiful world, and he created us to live in loving relationship with God and with one another and to care for the world and for one another. This was God's plan for the world. Unfortunately, we humans do not always choose to live according to God's plan. I'm afraid that many of the problems in the world that we've been praying about are the result of our human failure to live according to God's plan. And that led me to the thought that perhaps God's plan for solving the problems in our world is for us, his followers, to work to make the changes that we see need to be made. In other words, I think God is calling us to be a part of the answer to our prayers for the world. And I think that's what Sally said just a minute ago. I don't know how it is she reads my mind. (laughs) Maybe that's the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Now, I know that this sounds like an overwhelming task. In any ways, the world is in such a mess. But when we read the Bible, we see that God usually works through people to accomplish his purposes. And in fact, God sent his son to become a person, one of us, in order to give us another chance to live in relationship with God and to do his will. Jesus came to show us and to tell us that God's plan for changing the world is for his people, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to work together to change the world so that it becomes more and more what God created it to be in the beginning. Jesus, God's Son, came into our world to bring the kingdom of God. And Jesus called disciples to join him in sharing the good news that the kingdom of God 
had come into the world through Jesus. In our study of the Gospel of Luke, we read in chapter 9 about how Jesus sent the twelve on a mission to proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, in today's scripture passage, we will read about how Jesus sent out 70 of his followers to join in this mission to proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God. Our scripture passage for today is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 24. If you would like to follow along, Luke 10, 1 through 24, or the words will be on the screen. Good to hear those pages turn and know that you're checking to make sure I'm telling you the truth. In Luke chapter 10, starting with verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick who are there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that clings to our feet we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a long passage. I want you to notice that Jesus said, The harvest is plentiful, 
but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go on your way. You know, there are people in the world, even today, who have not heard of God's great love for them. There are people right here in Muleshoe who do not know that God loves them, that God wants a relationship with them, and that God wants to save them from the mess that their life is in. There are people right here who are desperately in need of the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus brought the kingdom of God, but there are still people Many people who do not know about it. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I read somewhere that God's plan A for saving the world is for his people to share the good news with others. And God does not have a plan B. When we read about Jesus sending the twelve, we could still hold on to the idea that not everyone had to go. Only the chosen few, only the leaders had to go. But with today's passage, it is clear that was not the case. Jesus sent 70 of his disciples to join in his mission to proclaim the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. And that may very well have been all of Jesus' followers at that time. If we consider ourselves to be Jesus' followers today, how can we deny his call to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ and to work to transform the world into the kingdom of God? We are called to be God's instruments to answer our prayers for the world. We are called to change the world into the kingdom of God. I know that sounds like a radical step. After all, we modern Christians have understood Christianity to be about being a member of a church, being a good citizen, living a nice life. And if we're really faithful, we give some money to missionaries to go out into the world. We attend Sunday school class and Maybe we'll serve on a committee for the church or in a ministry for the church. And all of those things are wonderful. But do we really take seriously and personally Jesus' call for us to be on his mission to share our faith with others and to change the world? Consider this. The first part of Jesus' ministry was spent in Galilee, especially in the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. If you can't see it, they are up in the northern part uh, around the Sea of Galilee. In this area, Jesus preached and healed and cast out demons. Surely the people of this area had the greatest opportunity to know Jesus when he was most popular. And I am sure that many of them claimed that they believed in Jesus. They enjoyed the benefits of his ministry. They were impressed by his mighty words and the amazing things that he did. And these people in these Jewish cities would have considered the people of Tyre and Sidon to be ungodly, evil people who did not know or follow the one true God. Now listen to what Jesus said. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But at the judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. My friends, I'm afraid that there are many today who, like the people of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, have been given every opportunity to know and follow Jesus. People who may go to church. People who have Bibles, maybe even read them. People who claim to be Christians, but who have not repented. Who have not adopted the values of the kingdom of God. 
who have ignored Jesus' call to join in his mission. I'm afraid these people are going to be disappointed when the judgment comes. And we may not like to believe that there will ever be judgment, but in this scripture passage, Jesus says there will be judgment. Jesus also says that the proper response to his good news about the coming of the kingdom of God is repentance. We usually think of repentance as turning away from sin. Well, you know, the bad sins, not not the ones that I like. (laughs) But repentance means to redirect our entire life so that we live according to the values of the kingdom of God and join in Jesus' mission to transform the world into the kingdom of God. Of God. Have we really repented? In verse 16, Jesus said to the 70 that he sent out, Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. As in many other passages that we've studied, notice the emphasis on listening. And remember that to listen to Jesus. And now to listen to his disciples means not only to hear his words, but also to act on them, to put them into practice. If we do not listen and act on Jesus' words, and now on the words of his disciples, then we reject the good news, we reject Jesus, and we reject the one who sent Jesus. Now, if you're not sure who the one who sent Jesus is, that is made clear in verse 21, where Jesus says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. The one who sent Jesus is his Father, who is the Lord of heaven and earth. The one who created everything and calls us to be a part of that. Today's lesson is challenging. We're confronted with the idea that really there are no lukewarm, half committed Christians. Either you believe in Jesus enough to join in his mission, or you're not really his follower. And there will be judgment, perhaps especially for those of us who have heard the good news that the kingdom of God has come in Jesus, and yet do not repent and join in Jesus' mission to share that good news with others. And so I urge you to consider your response to Jesus' call on your life today. Are you not only listening, are you not only hearing the words, but also putting them into practice in your daily life? Are you joining in Jesus' mission to share the good news with others and to transform the world into the kingdom of God? As you consider your answer to these questions, let me bring to your attention verses 17 through 20 which describe the joy that the 70 experienced when they returned from their mission. They were amazed and overjoyed at the things they were able to do when they answered Jesus' call to go into the world on his mission. When we step out in faith and put Jesus' words into action, when we go into our world and share the good news with others, when we work to transform the world into the kingdom of God, we too will experience the great joy that comes from joining in Jesus' mission. And Jesus said that the thing we should really rejoice in is that your names are written in heaven. We certainly do rejoice when we have the assurance of the Holy Spirit that our names are written in heaven. And if, in fact, our names are written in heaven, if our lives have been transformed by our relationship with Jesus Christ, then surely we will join in Jesus' mission to share the good news with as many others as possible so that they too can have that assurance that their names are written in heaven too. A few weeks ago, our church leaders met to share our thoughts and prayers about where God is leading us as a congregation. We agreed that our mission as a church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We talked about our vision for the future of our church, and we decided that our vision for our church is that we will become a congregation of devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, striving to transform our world. And our primary goal 
is to change the culture of the congregation so that we focused at least as much attention toward reaching those outside the church as we do in serving those already in the church. Our mission, our vision, and our goal are based on Jesus' call to each of us to follow as his disciples and to join in his mission to transform the world into the kingdom of God. It's a high calling. And you, like me, probably ask, how will we do this? I believe it has to start with prayer. We have to sincerely pray that God will move in a mighty way in our own lives and in the life of the congregation to show us how to be on Jesus' mission in our world. We must pray for courage to answer Jesus' call, and we must encourage one another to grow as Jesus' disciples. You know, disciples grow in small groups, and this is why we're calling all of our study groups discipleship groups. The primary purpose of our discipleship groups is to encourage one another to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. And I've encouraged the leaders of our discipleship groups to provide opportunities for those who are a part of that group to practice sharing their faith with one another when they meet together so that it becomes more natural in sharing it with others. I've also asked each group to consider working together on a mission project. And as Sally mentioned today, the worship committee as a small group is taking up this project of the snack, snack pack for kids. They're answering Jesus' call. Through our mission projects, we can begin to change the world starting right here in Mule We can be instruments that God uses to answer our prayers for the world. If you're not already a part of a discipleship group, I strongly urge you to join a group. We've created a brochure with information about all of the discipleship groups that are meeting right now, and these brochures are on the information center table if you'd like to pick one up and take a look at the groups that are available. Starting early in November and for the next couple of months, I hope to lead a discipleship group in a study whose purpose is to help participants understand what it means to be Jesus' disciple in our world today. Because when we read about the disciples in the Bible, it doesn't automatically transfer to our world today. It's a little bit different, and so that's what this study is going to be about. The title of the study is A Disciple's Path. The study will last about eight weeks. November and December is my plan. There will be a workbook with daily assignments that participants in the study will be expected to complete. They won't last, it doesn't take very long to do the assignments. And uh, there's an insert in your bulletin describing in more detail about this study and giving you the opportunity to let me know if you're interested in participating in that study. Also, Deborah Kettner and I have been talking about maybe a mission trip for our church, maybe a mission trip perhaps this summer. And so if you're interested, if you have any interest at all in participating in a mission trip that would go someplace beyond Muleshoe, we don't have any details decided, just looking to see if there's any interest. There's a sign-up sheet on the information center table. If you just write your name down, then those of us who are interested will begin to, to meet together and to talk and to pray about what, how that might work out. So uh, if you have any interest, please sign up on the information center table. Our mission, our vision, and our goal call us to become laborers in the Lord's harvest. Remember, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Last week, we prayed for the world. Today's question is, are we willing to become those whom God uses to answer these prayers, to change the world? Let us pray.
Gracious God, we see that our world is not as you intended for it to be. Your son Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And now he calls us to join in his mission to share this good news with others. And to work to change the world so that it becomes more and more like the world you intended when you created it. The kingdom of God. So we pray for a desire and a courage to answer Jesus' call. I pray that you would work through our discipleship groups to change our lives and to use us to change the world. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.